In yesterday's video, Tamarkan's horde headed south after getting the blessings of the Dark Gods. However, their journey was fraught with challenges between orcs and the undead, starvation, and their path being destroyed. So they have to kind of redirect the entire army to head even further south. There were some good things. They had allies join them from the Beastmen, as well as gaining a bunch of Chaos Giants. But time is not on their side, so they need to keep moving. And we meet up again in Chapter 3 with the Horde, now several months later. And we learn a few very important things. The non-Nurgle Chaos forces are becoming very disgruntled and stay pretty far away from the main camp. In addition to that, Tamarkan now has a large regiment of Plague Ogres. These are literally just ogres from the Ogre Kingdom that have been corrupted by Nurgle and infused with his blight and putrid nature. Really what happened was, in the end of the last chapter, the Maga King took hold of the tyrant, Ogre Tyrant that is, his body when he did his little switcheroo, and as many of the ogres there broke, they were captured and inducted into Tamarkan's horde. However, their journey continues further south. They go through the haunted forest to fight a bunch of Noblars and fight scores more ogre tribes. This is something they knew was going to happen when the path that they originally wanted to go down was wrecked. They knew it's going to be a lot more fighting through ogres. And I'll pull the map up here. At this point, they begin to turn west. And that finally puts them on a course to meet up with the Empire. But it also puts them on the path of some pretty dark forces, particularly the Chaos Dwarves, located right here at the Black Fortress. And as they are approaching this Black Fortress, the endless river of men that is Tamarkan's Horde sees the disciplined ranks upon ranks of the Chaos Dwarves led by one leader, Drazoth the Ashen. The two forces line up. Now here's the thing, Tamarkan knows that he has enough troops to win. The problem is, doing so is going to have a lot of casualties. It's going to cost him dearly to do so. And the thing is, the book points out, Drazoth knows this too. He knows that he's not going to decimate the forces of this horde. But it also takes the time to say that Chaos Dwarves are even more stubborn than their better kin. Meaning, you can't let this fight go unchallenged. You can't let this colossal horde of corrupting Nurgle forces just walk into your territory and walk out. And so the armies clash. There's arrows and fire and cannons from the Chaos Dwarves. And while the hordes suffer losses, they really just prioritize taking out those cannons above everything else. And at the end of the first day, they're able to destroy most of them. Understand... This is a lot of casualties that make this happen. It took waves upon waves of cheap lives on the part of Tomerkin's Horde to make that happen. And only when that is done does the Horde unleash the War Mammoths. And at this point, Drazoth sees what just happened. They wasted their cannons fighting the most expendable troops, but now they have nothing to fight the real power of his army. The War Mammoths, the Giants, the Plague Ogres, all those huge things. And so having no options at this point, the Chaos Dwarves fall back into their impregnable fortress called the Black Fortress. Now it's going to be really hard to pry them out of there, but you can't really let the force go unchallenged. And so what they did was they got Sail the Faithless back again, and he was tasked as being an emissary. As a side note, he has sort of become the de facto leader for all the non-Nurgle forces in the Horde, which make up a lot of them actually. So already he's trying to kind of create a potential schism. And he was tasked to deliver a message to the Black Fortress. Tamarkan acknowledged the honorable fight that just went down and offers an invitation for the legions of Asgore to join the Horde. They want their ranged weapons and their might. And really the offer is, join us or die. But Drathoth the Ashen hears this plan and thinks about it for quite a long time. Several weeks actually he does a lot of debating. The thing is, he largely ignores the threat of Tarmacon. You're not going to get in here. He's not worried about dying. But he does see some potential gains. Because he wants to go to the Empire as well. He wants the technological advancements that the Kingdom of Men has made. Magic tomes, gems, metals, weapon designs, even rudimentary steam tanks, things like that. He's sure that the Dwarven equivalents are better, 
but they can use that technology to build upon, reverse engineer things. But there's a lot of risk in this because he might go out there and come up with nothing. So he's kind of mulling this over. What can I gain? And then how can I manipulate this situation to come out on, on a top? So ultimately he does agree. So long as the horde kind of detours for a little bit to help clear out some of his local enemies. And the reason I think it really does this is because even if the campaign fails and the chaos dwarf forces that he sends with them don't come back with anything and the army falls apart, whatever, he will at least have cleared his lands. So the worst case scenario is that he loses some troops, but his local enemies are all gone and that's okay. And when I say clear out his lands, there's like a local orc tribe, there's like a bone dragon nearby that they have to go fight. And with this, a couple months go by as Tamarkan agrees to these conditions. And at this point, we are met yet again by Tamarkan's number one enemy that he can't seem to beat, and that is time. Because he's just kind of sitting in the middle of this map, and I'll pull it up here. But whispers begin to circulate that he's losing the favor of the gods. His numbers are slowly bleeding out, and he's losing momentum in every way. Both literal, we're not moving towards the enemy, our goal, but also people are losing trust in me. Also remember, Chaos Champions need to keep the attention of the gods once they have it. They need to keep impressing them. There's no neutral. There's no like, I feel okay about Timer Khan. There's he either pleases me or he is nothing to me. And so as soon as the kind of conditions are met from the Legions of Asgore, the Chaos Dwarves, he says, this is it. We're done. Get your stuff together. We're moving. We got to keep rushing. And so the army moves again. Now, again, we're trying to keep a running tally because this is really going to matter in the upcoming chapters. He now has giants, plague ogres, and chaos dwarves as they move to a region called Death Pass. Now, the last two chapters here have really been about setbacks, but now he's finally here. You see, I'll pull up the map again. Death Pass leads you right into the Border Princes. This is the southernmost region of what the Empire is. He was going to have to cross these lands eventually anyway. And now he is finally here. As he enters the territory of the Border Princes, a collection of small and petty kingdoms south of the Empire, whose rulership and land claims are kind of in constant flux. It's a very unstable political landscape. The Horde arrives there and just lose it. And I don't mean like they lose it in battle, but they see this rich countryside of meat and fighting and water and everything they haven't had in almost a year, and they just go nuts. They shatter into like a hundred smaller warbands and collectively cripple the entire region. They just spread like a cancer. Everyone's having fun. They get their fill, annihilating civilizations. After some time, messengers are dispatched to bring them back in. And once everyone's had their fill of fun, food, and slaughter, they returned. There's a few tribes that grew tired of Tamarkan's commands and they kind of split. They just weren't seeing his momentum working. And so from this, he has even fewer troops. But the ones that he does still have are better rested and ready for a fight. It's also pointed out that at this moment, he's really begun to struggle with the Chaos Dwarves. They move very slowly and their looting is taking forever. And the reason I keep mentioning all these things is because in the back of your mind, you have to keep a running clock. This is a very long campaign with not a lot of rewards. So now to have this ally from you didn't start with come and slow you down even more is just frustrating. And with this, his army is struggling to stay together. But Tamarkan tries to press them on. They're trying to get to the Black Mountains, which is the actual south border of the empire before the Empire is alerted to their presence, which they have no idea when that's going to be. So they have to keep moving and move, move, move fast. And as they move north to the base of the Black Mountains, just this hurricane-level storm rolls in, and for days they sat and watched as the pass they're supposed to be going up is turned into a raging river. And at this point, things are kind of on the cusp of falling apart, because now they're just pinned in between a land where they're all getting very easily distracted in their actual goal, and every single day, their prey, the Empire, has a chance to fortify. At this point, one of the Chaos Dwarves has a potential solution. See, he scouted the area, and he knows of a few Dwarven mines that are built into the Black Mountains. They found one, he said, hey, if we take it, we can enter them, 
and probably hit the Empire further west than they were expecting and get them completely unaware. And here's the thing, without really taking in any other counsel, Tamarkan is elated and the drums start and the horde begins to move. And so when the chapter ends, there's actually this, it actually ends on this conversation of a debate amongst some of the followers because really what you're starting to see is those fragments, those little cracks in their trust of the Chaos God's favor on Tomarkan is being put to the test. And so some are saying, does the hurricane show the God's disfavor? Like, should we really not be following him because they don't seem to be blessing him like they did in the beginning? But then some would counter, does the fact that he made allies along the way who are also evil and chaos uh, and they provided a potential solution, meaning the past, does that show their approval? And so there's all kinds of just trying to interpret what's going on. And everyone's trying to understand these events. And Sale the Faithless is using this as a chance to sow further mistrust. Now, doing a chapter review. This chapter was about two things, really. The Horde growing and diversifying and reaching their mark. Because they gained Plague Ogres and Chaos Dwarves. And they finally made it to the borders of the Empire. And I'm not going to lie, it got kind of tired of doing detour after detour. But on that note, like I said, remember what this book is. It tells great stories, it introduces new models, and gives you campaign reasons to play. So all these little side things that they get distracted with are battles that are represented in the campaign system and things like that. So yes, there's a lot of narrative gymnastics, kind of squeezing plague ogres and chaos giants and the whole chaos dwarf line. But they're all important because they're reflected in those systems that this book is really all about. So I get it, it's for a good reason. Looking at the story we do have though, things are not going well. Every day an event happens, Tamar Khan seems to lose men, lose faith, and lose control. He loses them through battles, through deserters, through natural deaths, because there are a lot of this, the regions they were in were no food, no water. And even though he's brought allies in, his army, which was once kind of snowballing as like picking up chaos forces all over the place, is now in decline. And not just from a military standpoint. Seeing a champion get the favor of the dark gods and then following them is almost a religious act. They don't have to like Tamarkan, but they follow him because they believe it's the gods' will. Though natural consequence of time and detour, that faith and that zeal is beginning to waver. It doesn't help that Sail the Faithless is there throwing fuel on that fire. Because realistically, we're learning more and more about Sail that what he wants is the Horde to fall apart and for him to be in charge of the biggest faction of it. That faction, of course, being the non Nurgle's forces. Now, we do get some hints as to what they're walking into. Basically, it's an abandoned dwarven mine, potentially filled with orcs and goblins. And with that little teaser, I will go ahead and end today's video. So thank you all so much for tuning in. If you know someone who's interested in this army or just old world lore, I'm trying my best. It's not something that I'm really attuned to. But go ahead and share this video with them and give it a like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. Thank you all so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you in tomorrow's video.